Hello, amazing people. Wonderful afternoon to you guys. I hope you are doing good. I'm doing fine. I'm very happy and excited to come your way. Today, we're going to be discussing, you know, um, sponsorship for the purposes of obtaining a green card. I'm live on Instagram. Um, hello, Instagrammers, and I'm live on Facebook as well. Let me send out some shout outs and waves to the people on Instagram. Okay, so I see um, AB, Jomo, who's joined, Amuzu, Yadobie, Jekum, um, Green Hills Barber Salon, joined on Instagram. It's Lena B, joined Abdullahi, um, Pfizer Abdul. Guys, you're very welcome. Nilaba, Lulu's Food Service. Um, thank you guys for joining us on Instagram. Okay, so if you watch this live video later, of course, you have you're free to subscribe to my youtube channel if you're watching on youtube if you're watching on facebook don't forget to like follow and make sure you turn your notifications on so that as soon as we have you know we go live you can you can see that we've gone live so it's going to be a very quick video as usual and we're discussing again um you know green card sponsorship okay so in order to be able to get a green card here in the united states you should have a sponsor you should have somebody who's sponsoring you um guys don't worry if i keep shifting my head because i'm live on facebook and i'm live on instagram so i want to i'll be toggling between the two screens so don't worry about that um so if you are going to file any type of green card application most likely you need somebody somebody known as a sponsor of course there are exceptions as there are a lot of exceptions to a lot of legal rules okay so for example if you're filing a vawa based green card application you do not need an affidavit of, of support okay so if you're filing a green card you need somebody to sponsor you if you're applying for a green card you need somebody to sponsor you and this sponsorship is known as known as an affidavit of support the person needs to demonstrate the sponsor who's going to be petitioning for you needs to tell the u.s government that look I'm the one petitioning for this person and I'm going to be responsible for him. I will not allow him to become a public charge. So this video is going to focus very, you know, more exclusively on the difference between who a joint sponsor is and who a household wage earner is. Okay. That's what we're going to be discussing in this specific video. I've done a ton of videos on the affidavits of support. You know, what is an affidavit of support? What the contract means and all of that. So if you're looking for more information on that, don't forget to watch my other videos on YouTube, on Instagram, Facebook. Um, just search AK Poku Law and you'll be able to pull everything up. So today we're focusing on what's the difference between a joint sponsor and a household wage earner. Facebook is dropping your comments. I see some Instagrammers dropping comments. So um amuzu says hello um divorce lawyer welcome tevia welcome mommy Bwahima. welcome miss Inchiwa, fifi um all of you guys welcome 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 okay so let me let's get started um let me share my screen right here and then we will be talking about it let's start with who is a household wage earner guys remember that in order to be to get a green card or an immigrant visa or even a, any type of non-immigrant visa you have to be admissible to the u.s if you're a public charge you're inadmissible being a public charge means you're going to be a burden on the u.s taxpayer you're going to come and take medicaid you're going to come and take food stamps you're going to take you know um government benefits the means tested form of government benefits okay so in order to avoid foreigners from doing that and milking the taxpayers everybody who applies for a green card needs to have somebody standing behind them and saying, I'm responsible for this foreigner. I'll be responsible financially for them. I'll make sure they are not a burden on the U.S. Uh, pocket or on the U.S. taxpayer or on the U.S. coffers. Okay, so that's the, the, the point. If you're going to be applying for a green card, you need to demonstrate that you are not, you are not inadmissible, okay, um, based on the public charge rule by... First of all, filing something known as, known as an affidavit of support. That's an I-86, so that's the affidavit of support. And to do that, um, you need to normally be making above a certain, you know, above a certain amount. Um, you have to be making normally 125% above the federal poverty guideline for your household size, okay? 
So, um, of course, if you're in the military active duty, then you, you should be making above 100% um, of the poverty guideline for your household size. You can find this guideline on the, on the website. I mean, on Google, I-864P. That's the poverty guideline. Guideline It's released every year, and it shows you what the poverty guideline they will be using will be. So let's talk about, first of all, what is income? For the purposes, for, for the purposes of an I-864, what is income? First of all, an income is defined by law. It's defined to mean the total unadjusted income on your tax returns, okay? So the money on your tax returns before deductions and um, including salary, monetary gains from any other source such as rent, interest, dividends, okay? So that's what is um, income. So there's a special definition, a, a technical, def def a legal definition for what income is. So the first thing we'll look at is who is a household wage earner? If you're going to be using an, uh, you know, you're, if you're going to be using a household wage earner to support the income of the main sponsor, because the sponsor does not make above 125% um, of the poverty guideline for his household size, then you need to file. The household wage earner is going to fill out a separate form known as the I-864A. You, you can contrast this, you can, you can, you can um, differentiate this from the joint sponsor. If you're going to be using a joint sponsor, then the joint sponsor should fill out an I-864, a separate I-864. So that's one of the main differences. Household wage and I will fill out an I-864A, joint sponsor will fill out an I-864. Now let's get into when to use a household wage earner and when to use a joint sponsor because they are very different, um, well, you know, that they're, they're very different concepts, if I should say, or the different um, ways in which you have to use either of, of these two people. So let, the first one is the household wage earner. So normally the income of a household wage earner, okay, I'm sharing my screen on Facebook. Unfortunately, we don't have it on Instagram. So Facebook, yes, please follow me. Income of a household wage earner, um so this will include a sponsor's spouse okay so the sponsor remember the sponsor is a is the person who's the pet, the petitioner of the green card in a, every petition there's a in petition in green card applications there'll be a petitioner and there'll be a beneficiary the person petitioning is a um sponsor so um in Income of a household wage earner, including sponsor's spouse and other persons claimed as dependents in the most recent tax year. For these people, so if you are the spouse of a of a of a sponsor, or you have been claimed as a dependent on a sponsor's tax returns, then it doesn't matter that you you do or you do not live in the sponsor's house. And or you you know in in other ways in other words you do it doesn't matter whether or not you reside in the sponsor's household, you can be a household wage earner. That's one category. The other category of household wage earners would be other relatives, and these relatives could be a, a father, a mother, adult son, adult daughter, brother or sister, and these people have to have the same principal residence as the sponsor. Okay, so on the one hand, you're either the, the sponsor's spouse or you're another person who has been claimed as a dependent on the sponsor's tax returns for the most recent tax year. Or you are father, brother, mother, adult son, adult daughter, um, sister of the sponsor, and you are in the same house as the sponsor. And then remember that to be a sponsor, you have to be at least 18 years old. And with the household wage and that, you do not need to be a U.S. citizen or a green card holder for the purposes of the affidavit of support. Um, okay, so exactly. So to have your income counted as a household member, again, as I said, you will have to file, fill out the I-864A. And what that means is that, so remember, the main I-864 which the sponsor fills out. There's a contract between the sponsor and the U.S. government that I promise I'm going to res be responsible for this foreign aid, foreign national. If you if an, a household wage earner fills out the I-864 A, it's a contract by the household with you know between the household wage earner and the sponsor, and they are providing that they will be liable both jointly and severally for any type of reimbursement obligation that um the sponsor incurs. Okay, so that's 
I hope it's it's quite clear. It's quite technical, but I, I'm trying to break it down. So hopefully it makes sense. Now let's move on to who is a joint sponsor, guys. Who's a joint sponsor? I hope you guys understand household wage earner. Let me give some few ways. Um, I believe I saw some questions. I see um Hariella Lawson who says hello. Um, I see Yadobia. Okay, she waved back. And then I see somebody who said, um, I think Bar Barbara. Somebody said, my lawyer. Hello, my lawyer. Uh, I can't find you anymore. Oh, yeah. Green Hills Barbara Salon says, hey, my lawyer. Okay. Okay. Hello, my lawyer. Okay, I see that. And then there is um, Nyiliba, who says, good to be back. And then she says, I have a quick question for IS751. Today, we're not discussing IS751. So, guys, just to read a few comments, let's go back. Who is a joint sponsor? So normally, if a sponsor, again, cannot meet the in minimum in income requirement, um, again, as I described, you need to be making above 125% above the federal poverty guideline in order to be eligible as a sponsor for the purposes of filing a green card for somebody. So if you, do, you are not making that amount, you either have to find help. Where do you find the help from? You can get somebody known as a household wage and you pull the income together and you file the sponsorship for the imminent or prospective green card applicant. Or you can go in for somebody known as a joint sponsor. With a joint sponsor, if the main sponsor cannot meet the minimum requirement, again, you go in for that. And that person has to be at least, number one, 18 years and above. With a joint sponsor, the person has to be a U.S. citizen or a green card holder. And then the person also has to be domiciled in the U.S. The joint sponsor will, again, as I stated, will file a separate I-864, all right? Unlike the household wage earner who will file an I-864A, that's a different type of form or application. Um, so the I-864 is a separate one. So with a joint sponsor, the sponsor files one I-864, then the joint sponsor files an I-864. So there'll be two I-864s. If you're a, a household wage earner, the, the main sponsor files an I-864, household wage earner form files an I-864A. So with a joint sponsor, again, um, you have to be a citizen, a green card holder. And with the joint sponsor, here's one major bombastic difference. With the joint sponsor, you need to meet the minimum income requirements separate and apart from the sponsor. Remember with the household wage earner, you're allowed to pull your resources together. The household wage earner need not meet the minimum income requirements separately and apart from the main and, and, and apart from the main sponsor however with the joint sponsor if you're filing an ia 64 by yourself then you need to meet the minimum guidelines separate and apart from the sponsor okay so again for purposes of emphasis the joint sponsor's income must equal at least 125 percent of the federal poverty guideline um for the joint sponsor's household size unless of course you're on active duty um, and the immigrant is a joint sponsor, spouse, or child. Income flow will then be hundred percent of the federal poverty guideline. Okay, so um, pretty much, I just I've, I'm I'm happy I've been able to establish the difference. You guys get the difference now. Remember that sponsor and sponsor and joint sponsor cannot pull their incomes together, as as we've said, they cannot pull their incomes. They can't put their incomes together. They cannot pool their incomes. So an intended immigrant, and again, an intended immigrant, you cannot have more than one joint sponsor. So you can have three I-864s on one application. That will be rejected. It, it's, it's against statute, okay? You have to have just two. If you find that the joint sponsor does not meet the income requirements, you need to let that joint sponsor go and find another joint sponsor who will, be, who will make at least 125% of the F the federal poverty guideline for their household size. So the minimum is making, so you should make above the 125 um, um, percent of the federal poverty guideline. Okay, so pretty much I think I've, uh, I've, I've been able to talk about the difference. That's it, just very quick live video guys. I hope you guys um, have benefited from this video and this has helped to um, explain things better. Um, as usual, I, I have more people on Instagram than on Facebook. Facebook is, oh my gosh, 
I'm glad I finally started coming live on Instagram because the, the Instagram crowd is, you know, very energetic. I have a comment on Facebook. Angela Baji says, hello, Ikuya. Hello, Angela. Thank you so much for joining. I'm really grateful to you. Um, Facebook has dropped me your comments. Um, we have a, a few more questions. Let me see. Divorce lawyer app on Instagram says, so as a general rule, would you say it's better to go with a household and uh, if possible? Okay, so pretty, it really depends on your circumstance. You know, it all depends on the numbers, numbers, numbers. Um, when you have the household wage and, uh, and we pull the incomes, how much is it? You know, we need to calculate with the ha household size and kind of make sure that um, it qualifies or meets the minimum requirement. So it just depends on how much the money is because in I-864, the more money, the better. The more money, the better. Because what you are looking to demonstrate to the U.S. immigration is that you are able to prevent the, the prospective immigrants from becoming a burden on the U.S. taxpayer. So if the, the federal poverty guideline minimum for the household size is $33,000 and you are making $34,000 with a household wage and up, um, you know, it's not good enough. It's not good enough. However, if you see that with a joint sponsor, you have, let's say the main sponsor is not making enough. The main sponsor, for for example, is making $32,000 for the household size and the joint sponsor is making $130,000 a year. Then for sure, go with the joint sponsor, you know, because they meet it most likely for the household size. Um, you know, so it depends on the numbers. You need to review the numbers, the tax returns, who are the dependents and the circumstances. And statute specifically states that it's important that the sponsors have to maintain the income. You know, they have to maintain that income. So if you file the most recent tax returns and you were making a set, you know, above the federal poverty guideline, for example, by the time the impending immigrant is going for the interview, then um, the, the the prospective immigrant, if their income, the income of the sponsor has reduced, that's going to be problematic. So the key is also making sure that these people, these sponsors are going to be maintaining that income. And there's no case where the, adjudic the adjudicator is concerned that um, the sponsor, the joint sponsor or household wage earner is not going to be making that amount. Because when that happens, then you are back to, you know, cause 90, that's square root of zero, right? Because the point is to make sure that the um, um, the immigrants coming in is not going to be relying on the taxpayer. I'm sorry, divorce lawyer. As you know, everything in law it depends. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Um, we have Hariella Lawson who says this was great, awesome. Hariella is on on Instagram. We have Miss Yesuto who's joined. Thank you, Miss Yesuto, uh, for joining. Amuzu says, lawyer, is it true that when filing for a green card, you must marry him or her for you for four years? That's not true. You can get married for one day. In fact, one hour. Um, even if you get married for one hour or even one minute, you can file a marriage-based green card. And what I'll tell you is this is if your marriage has lasted for less than two years, you get a conditional green card. If it's been more than um, you know, um two years since you guys got married at the time of approval of the green card, then you get the 10-year green card. So there's no rule that you should be married for four years, you know. Um, I'm not sure where that came from, but no, you can be married for one minute. As soon as you have your marriage certificate and you can prove that the marriage is bona fide, then you can file your green card application, okay? We have a question on Facebook and then I'll be jumping off. Peter Kwame Wilson says, hi, doing great work. I have a pending F2A case since May 2020. I see. Okay, so are you the spouse of a green card holder? Um, that's the um, preference immigrant category um, spouse or <laughs> minor child of a green card holder, but I believe you would most likely be a, a spouse of a green card holder. Well, pending, I don't know, have you been documentarily qualified? Keep waiting. There's just a whole lot of backlogs. So um, unless you have an emergency, then you cannot really... Um, try to get it expedited but if you have a good reason why it should be expedited then certainly go for some assistance all right guys so i'm just really happy to have had this discussion with you i hope it clarifies the i864 is a very complicated tax document if you need assistance please don't hesitate to call me 802 7800 Phoebe Malet, i'm so happy to have you here thank you so much for joining 
beautiful Phoebe. The voice lawyer app says, understood. Thank you for breaking that down. You're very welcome. I'm so excited to have other fellow lawyers join. Gray Bible, Nicole, Dimana, I'm Ken join. Okay, guys, I hope you guys are having a wonderful Wednesday so far. I will come your way again. This was just a very, very quick one. Amuza, I'll try to answer that question in another live video. You know, people don't like to sit through long live videos. So this was just a very um, brief one. I'll come again and hopefully I can answer your question. I wish you guys a wonderful rest of your day. Please take care. And if you know anybody, a friend, family member who's looking for an immigration attorney, don't forget to refer. I just had, some, normally I hear a lot of very sad things with regards to immigration. So this morning, um, I somebody called me. She was in tears, crying, crying, crying. And um, it had to do with the person's a very close, close, close family member. And they had immigration challenges. And unfortunately, they never reached out to me. They, um, for some reason, they knew I was, I, I don't know why, but they, they, she said it just didn't click for her to reach out to me. And they went around trying to call senators, calling different people who could not give them legal advice and who could not guide them through the process. And unfortunately, um, the un unbelievable thing, very, very devastating happened. And it's a tragedy. I can't seem to get to advice because I'm like, I was right here. This is what I do. This is my wheelhouse. When it has to do with the U.S. embassy based in Ghana, I'm, I mean, that's where I play. When it has to do with the USCIS, U.S. immigration here in the U.S. because... Um, I'm licensed as an attorney in Ghana and here in the U.S. So, you know, both jurisdictions, I can I work with clients try to resolve, trying to resolve their, their issues. So please don't go contacting people because she actually even spoke with, with a lawyer, but the lawyer is not from Ghana, an immigration lawyer. So the person was not able to help them the way they should. I'm fortunate, but um, I'm very devastated. I don't want to go into details because, of course, this was a very private matter. But maybe I could ask her permission later to share the story, of course, without names, just for learning purposes. So please make sure you are referring us to people who need help. It, you don't only help. You you really, for me, what I say is when you refer somebody to me, you're not necessarily helping me. You're helping them. You are giving them access to a brilliant, the best immigration lawyer that they could ever find for their case. And so please do them a favor. Don't allow them to hop from place to place. And in the end, get devastated because they don't get the help that they need. And the, some of the consequent that's things that happen that nobody can take back or, you know, undo. Very great tragedy. So I'm, I'm still, um, you know, mourning and very devastated that this was something I could help. But unfortunately, they did not come to me. But yes, at the end of the day, you can't force anybody. I, I All I can do is keep educating, keep reaching out and keep sharing my stuff. And hopefully... If you guys need my help, you will reach out to me and then I will assist you moving forward. Okay, guys. So um, thank you all for joining. It's been such a pleasure interacting with all of you. I hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.